Uh, we've been partnering with them for a little over a year here at the league, and we're really excited about the potential for you all from our bicycle friendly communities to continue to build on your successes in promoting and encouraging bicycling locally in your community um, to find new economic development and other kinds of opportunities for building a strong bicycle travel and tourism program. Uh, and then to share with you a great case study of how this could work in your community, we'll also hear from Lee McLaughlin, the Senior Director of Marketing for Visit Tucson, which is a gold level bicycle friendly community that's been working with Cycle Life HQ. Um, so I'm really looking forward to today's presentations um, so you can hear about Cycle Life HQ and, and how it's been working in Tucson. Before I hand things over to our presenters, though, I just have a couple housekeeping notes. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and we will email the recording link to all registrants, um, most likely tomorrow, along with a PDF of the slides. So don't worry if you um, miss something or if you have to leave early or if you want to share this presentation with others in your community, including tourism bureau staff. Um, we definitely encourage you to, to share this widely um, with anyone who will find it useful. So look for an email from me, amelia at bikeleague.org, in the next day or two with that recording, and we'll also post it to our website on bikeleague.org. Um, secondly, you'll, you've probably all noticed that all attendees are muted, but we will welcome questions from you, which you can submit at any time during today's presentations by typing them into the question chat box that you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen. So we'll save time at the end of the webinar today to answer as many questions as possible, and we can also follow up with you via email if we don't get a chance to answer your question during the call, but please feel free to submit questions. Um, by typing them in at any time, and um, I'll be moderating those. Um, I also might type in responses if it's something quick and easy that we can um, respond to, but otherwise we'll answer them verbally at the end of the presentations. All right, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charles Black, CEO of Cycle Life HQ. Um, thanks so much for joining us, Charles. Thank you very much, Amelia, and uh, welcome to everyone, and thanks for giving up a little bit of uh, your time today and uh, hopefully we can make this of some, some real value for you. Uh, so as Amelia said, I'm the founder and CEO of, of Cycle Life HQ. And the reason I set up Cycle Life HQ was pretty simple. Um, when I went to destinations, uh, generally for work, um, I, I really wanted to you know, ride around the, the local area, but that's where I got stuck. So as a consumer going into a destination, um, trying to find out where to ride, there were numerous problems. The first thing that I'd do is say, I'd type into Google, um, riding in you know, XYZ destination. And what I'd generally be given from Google was a whole range of information that wasn't relevant for me. So there might be some Strava feeds, um, which is a, an application used by high-end road cyclists um, that is of no value for me. There might be um, some information from a, um, a blogger about rides, but it didn't have where the ride starts. It didn't have where I can hire a bike. Um, it didn't have details about whether or not, you know, it was a two hour ride or a four hour ride. Um, and then there were lots of what I call community sourced um, information. So, um, and these are some of the, the more general um, applications around that basically, people load up all their rides and you can see 10 different versions of the same ride. And for me as a consumer, it made it really hard for me to spend money in your destination, like really hard. Um, and only because I'm a little bit pig headed, I decided to, to go for that ride. And so I thought, well, surely there must be a, a, a bit of a better way of doing it. Uh, so what we, what we did was to create um, a, a platform that basically brings all the destinations information about bicycle tourism together into one place. So the basic things of where to ride, where to hire a bike, where are the cycle friendly cafes, and in doing that information, making sure that you can search on it for you know, the type of riding experience you're looking for, the length of ride um, um, that, that you're looking for, and also your, your relative level of fitness, which in my case is not too good, but it, um, at least I could put you know, low level of fitness and uh, then find the rides that, that are suited to me. And so that's what we did. We created a, a platform, which is sort of a one to many platform. So the, the advantages of it, first of all, is that it's very inexpensive. Um, and secondly, it just doesn't take much time at all. Um, so that's why I created um, Cycle Life HQ. And we've been working with really good partners such as Visit Tucson and other places across the States 
um, to really help you know those local destinations to better project and amplify um, their, their bicycle tourism um, assets locally. Um, we've got some great partners that we're working with, uh, the League of American Bicyclists, Adventure Cycling Association, and the International Mountain Bike Association. And the reason that's important is that we're getting a lot of the content about those local rides and putting those into, um, into, into the platform so that consumers can find those local destinations and can find out where to ride. Uh, so I think I've talked a little bit about um, you know, the, 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 the generation of, of Cycle Life HQ. Um, the, the, the things that we're really focused on in, in a destination is to really help you to um, make sure that you can showcase your assets, be you a destination that's just starting off in the bicycle tourism area or, or a destination that's, that's really well organised. And the, the purpose of that is to, is to grow jobs and opportunities in those local destinations. And really there are a range of benefits to individuals and businesses and local industry. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Jeff um, uh, Miller, who will go through um, uh, some of the, the, the features of the platform, but also probably more importantly for your perspective, some of the better practices of things that we've, we've learnt um, over, the, over the last couple of years that we've been doing this business about what it really makes uh, what destinations need to do to be successful in terms of bike tourism. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Apologies for my little screen mess up there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, Charles. Um, thanks for being in the future there, Charles, uh, quite literally. <laughs> Happy tomorrow. Um, so this is Jeff Miller, and I've, I've been uh, a member and, and fan and partner of the league uh, for many years, and I, I've known many of you through my, my many years working with local and and state uh, and national bicycle and pedestrian advocacy um, through the League of American um, uh, Bicyclists, but also when I was heading up the Alliance for Biking and Walking in many years as the ED of the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. And even back in my Bike Coalition of Maine days, I, I really um, was excited with how much bicycle travel um, had a win-win uh, message uh, for better bicycling. And so um, I, I just want to share whether whether you represent uh, tourism agencies, whether you work, represent communities, uh, you're an advocate, an enthusiast, um, bicycling really has so many applications here and, and bicycle tourism and travel specifically uh, as, a, as an economic development engine that uh, really sort of pushes aside any of the the political banter and so forth. Even even some of our usual foes have a hard time arguing against uh, benefiting the economy. So a lot of what we want to share today is talking about some of the best practices of some of those destinations that really have embraced bicycle travel and tourism. Um, the ability for uh, local businesses and communities to capitalize on this, um, how to help make it easier for people. Um, we're going to obviously highlight a lot of the Cycle Life HQ platform, but I think there's a lot of these sort of good practices that are just worth absorbing anyhow. Um, but then we're also going to share um, our sort of uh, profit sharing piece uh, that can directly support um, local advocacy trails and so forth. Uh, first, let's go ahead and talk about the big picture and, and bicycle tourism. And I think um, all too often people think of bicycle tours, tourists or bicycle travelers um, with this sort of shot. The, the, the folks who carry a lot of gear and ride really long distances, and I myself have been one of these people on many a trip. Um, and, you know, certainly as a 21-year-old bicycling across the country, uh, sort of really getting, getting a lot of my ideas for my career in bicycle advocacy for the rest of my life, um, I was living a little bit on the cheaper side, partially just being a college student at the time. You know, I was free camping as often as I could. I was cooking most of my own meals. Um, but that's just one little segment. I want to make it really clear when we talk about bicycle travel and tourism, we're talking about all types of bike travel. So we're talking about retirees, um, uh, you know, baby boomers to millennials, people who are enjoying bicycling, whether it's on road, on trail, or off road, on on gravel or or, or uh, dirt, you know, single track trails. Um, it could be people in an urban area enjoying sightseeing, um, you know, as well as a long distance touring, the the adventure bike packing. Um, it, it can be with, you know, group tours where people are paying as much as several hundred or even a thousand dollars a day. Um, it can be the charity events or, or other sorts of events, uh, whether they be competitions and so forth. So we're, we're talking very globally here about bicycle travel and tourism. There's lots of different shapes and sizes. And I think 
all of us can appreciate that we come to and appreciate different facets of bicycling. And we're really trying to capture that whole piece. Some of the common elements we see amongst bicycle travel and tourism is you know the the, the popularity of active travel, people wanting to have a good physical act, activity and experience um, while they're visiting communities, connecting with places, um, uh, really getting to know a community, uh, both the, the people, the, the, the culture, the nature, um, some of the history, and, and how bicycling um, really gives you an authentic experience. It's sort of the, the ultimate convertible. You're literally in the element, you're getting to meet people, and I think we've all had those sorts of experiences ourselves. Of course, the demographics of, of bicycle travelers and tourists are actually a pretty desirable set. Um, you know, by and large, bicycle travelers are far more educated, have much more disposable income. And so as I like to highlight, they're, they're high impact in all the good ways. They're spending more money. They're, um, they tend to want to eat um, better food and more of it. And they're looking for those more local types of options, not necessarily uh, just passing through town, eating, eating fast food. And, and because of the rate at which we travel or the opportunity to explore communities, we tend to stay longer in communities. Um, and then bicycle travelers and tourists are lower impact in the negative ways. Um, you know, in some of the, the, the tourist centric communities I've lived in, I've heard talk about needing to have three parking spaces for each visitor, each family where, where, you know, there was a parking space at the hotel, a parking space in the park, a parking space in town. And uh, with, with bicycling uh, travelers and tourists, obviously that impact is way, way, way less. Um, and just the impact on the infrastructure. The last stat is, is another really positive one. Um, we have a very close partnership with Google. And one of the things that Google has shared with us is that search terms related to bicycling in, or biking in, name your town, has gone up year over year, 43%. Um, we also know that bicycle travel and tourism, you know, hits different communities in different ways, but it does benefit all communities. Um, here's, a, here's a picture from the, the loop out in, in Tucson. Or really is um, that I was just at a couple of weeks ago. Um, amazingly wide bike path. Uh, this is not a road. This is a bike path uh, out in in Tucson. Um, so we know that that urban areas um, like Tucson definitely are benefiting from bicycle travel and tourism. But we also know that probably disproportionately rural communities are benefiting, especially um, uh, some very small communities. And adventure cycling has really done an amazing job chronicling some of this with small towns sometimes having 50 to a couple hundred people where businesses that might otherwise go out of business are staying open because of the bicycle travelers and tourists coming through or new lodging that are uh, and or new restaurants or cafes that are opening up um so that that economic impact does uh benefit across the board whatever type of community and it's really it's a sustainable form of development um you know we don't see this sort of crazy fad growth within bicycling it's something that's that's been growing it's been growing steadily and it sticks around um as mentioned you know, earlier a lot less uh a load in the negative impact the wear and tear on the roads um, and that there is a great job creation piece, whether that's helping current businesses growing or the generation of new businesses. In the big picture, bicycle travel and tourism is big dollars. Um, the 83 billion is the best estimate we're able to make uh, based off of the outdoor um, uh, uh, industry associations, outdoor recreation economy report that just came out last year. So they have uh, they've spelled out on wheeled trips that 83 billion in direct spending uh, uh, is spent. That that generates over 50, uh, over 13 billion in in local taxes that are going back to government agencies. Um, and then we've got the European Cycle Route Network and Tourism Report that's looking at bicycle tourist trips. And these are like tours that you're paying for, that that alone um, is 2.3 billion and that their estimates within Europe are at least 44 uh, billion euros. Um, there is some great new um, data that's being collected and, um, and some coming from our government agencies that we look forward to sharing uh, with some of our other partners, Adventure Cycling and League and others uh, in the coming months. But um, uh, this, these are some of the numbers we have right now, which are uh, significant. One of the 
one of the challenges for bicycle travel and tourism is that that it is very uh, similar to what we consider a cottage industry. There's there's no single ownership of it. I mean, we we certainly know of the bike industry, uh, which is actually much smaller than the bicycle travel and tourism, uh, because when you think about it, when people are um, uh, traveling by bicycle, they're spending much more than the equipment, even even those who spend a lot on really nice equipment uh, over the course of the life of that bicycle, um, staying in, in lodging, eating out at restaurants, uh, paying for trips and so forth, it, it, it racks up much, much more. But the key thing is it's very different than, say, the ski industry, where you have several key players who are able to sort of help um, uh, direct marketing or set pricing or um, you know really sort of guide experiences and so forth so it is it is something that's much more spread out um, and and I think that's one of the things that a lot of us are attracted to about bicycling is it isn't just strictly a big corporate thing um, but but being scattered it does create a lot of challenges and barriers and for those de destinations, you know, they kind of are in a place of like, well, where where do we connect with this audience? Um, how do we fund some of this, or how do we market and promote it? Um, you know, for businesses, they may not understand what the opportunities are, or how to connect with customers, um, or how to connect with other businesses. And then there's some of the big questions, of course, for the bicyclists, the consumers themselves are where can I ride and what's a suitable and you know just uh, some very classic challenges. What we really see in, in our focus at Cycle Life HQ being focused specifically as an economic development company on bicycle travel and tourism is that, that we know from the research that we've done in 150 other uh, communities around the world is that the better quality experiences you give people, the more demand you generate. Um, that in turn generates more opportunities and offerings for those businesses and that generates more money and henceforth more investment back in the infrastructure and giving even better quality experiences. So really it's our goal to work with communities to help prime this pump, uh, this virtuous cycle for better bicycling. So again, let's, let's focus on the consumer as a key piece and these, these are the same questions I had just a few minutes ago. Where is it that I can ride? What is suitable? Where do I get to eat and drink or are there curated rides available? You know, what, what sorts of tours or themes or, or things can I connect with in this community? You know, who to talk to and where to even start? These, these are sort of the common challenges that, that cyclists have. And as Charles mentioned earlier, there's, there's a number of resources out there like Strava, Map My Ride, Ride with GPS and so forth. And they all do some pieces really well. Um, but they're not geared specifically for bicycle travel and tourism. They're more geared towards training or, um, uh, you know, specific events and so forth. Um, and, and what we know is that even in communities where there has been a real considered effort to try to pull information together, the information is still typically scattered. You might have a, a link to a PDF map on one club's website, a, a link to here's some rides that are happening, here's, uh, here, here's a list of hotels in our community, but it, it, it doesn't connect really well. And, and like any discerning audience, you know, cyclists, uh, we want our information in a place that's, that's easy to process, uh, easy to consume. And that's really a lot of what Cycle Life HQ does is to to bring the rides together, connecting it with the things to see and do, the places to stay, the places to eat, um, and 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 important relevant things like where you can get your bike serviced or where you can rent a bike if you don't have one with you. So it's really this idea of giving people a one-stop shop, and it's something that not only do we have that can stand alone on its own but that we're looking to make it super easy for, um, for the destination marketing organizations like Visit Tucson to be able to integrate it fully into their site because they have invested so much time and resources um, to, to share with their guests. So um, I wanna share some of the, the best practices we've seen and some of the things that we try to do to help destinations be better places for bicycle travel and tourism. And a few sneak peeks here from Tucson. Sorry, Lee, to, I don't want to steal too much of your thunder, but um, Tucson does an amazing job of this. Focus on what makes you special. 
obviously riding in the desert is something that, that folks are going to want, whether they want to do that on dirt or, or road, you know, having a chance to, to, to get on, see the amazing landscape of the desert is amazing, is, is important, but also connecting with that sort of urban uh, culture and fabric, um, which several of the rides uh, do. Connecting with others in the community, um, particularly the hospitality industry, economic development partners, the, the, the DOTs and so forth. I, mean, I think that's one of the things that really excites me as a lifelong advocate is that this is sort of a fresh approach to work with um, businesses and other agencies that are outside of our usual uh, partner wheelhouse. Um, here we have a few pictures from the, the site that we've developed for the September 11th National Memorial Trail, which is this amazing partnership in and of its own. Um, and, and this is a, a trail that connects the three sites from the September 11th um, uh, attacks uh, in New York City, Washington, D.C., and the Flight 93 site in rural Pennsylvania. You already have uh, on this green line here, you've got the CNO and Great Allegheny Passage. Um, along the East Coast, you've got the East Coast Greenway. And so what we were able to do working with the September 11th National Memorial Trail was help map out and post up on the on a website for them um, the route connecting from the Flight 93 site to New York City. And there was an inaugural ride just done this spring uh, with four riders that went very well. Um, one of the other best practices we see and that, that is actually central to what we offer and do is the digital wayfinding. And, and here's just a quick screenshot uh, from a ride I'm going to highlight a little later um, uh, that, that has uh, multiple sites along the ride. But you can see that this isn't just a route map and it's quite a convoluted one, but that it's also it's highlighting the sites, it's highlighting places um, to, to eat and stay along the ride. So connecting those local businesses uh, with the ride routes, sorry, um, it is absolutely essential. It's not just a matter of getting a ride, but like when I'm on my ride, what are the services I can expect? Um, you know, do I need to <laughs> bring a lot of water and food with me or am I gonna be able to stop along the way and see some of this? So we try to make that super easy for people. <coughs> Excuse me, my fingers are touchy as I was trying to mute my cough. Um, so the other thing that we know is sort of really getting to understand what the market um, demands are within a community. And, and there, you know, different communities have different things to offer um, and or tend to attract different types of audiences who are looking for different things. So one, uh, one community that we're working with uh, outside of Washington, D.C., a, a rural county in Maryland, um, where there's already a couple of triathlon events they're within a day's ride of Washington, D.C., and they've got some really family-friendly trails to ride. So those are sort of the, the key markets that we're sort of honing in on them is the opportunity to really uh, build upon uh, attracting uh, folks and, 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 and marketing themselves as uh, the, you know, the best backyard for, for bicycling in D.C to really enjoy and explore. Um, so I'm not gonna read all these, but obviously sort of connecting um, what, what you do have and or finding those gaps that you can, can fill. We do a lot of work early on and work we do with communities to assess what are the strengths, what are the challenges, and, and in particular, what are the gaps that need to be addressed for that community to better serve bicycle travel and tourism. Some of the the, the key things we really focus in on are accommodations and, and restaurants and, and, and highlighting their bicycle friendliness. And, you know, we obviously encourage uh, hotels and, and, and places to eat to um, partner with the league and to become uh, certified as bicycle friendly businesses. Um, but we also highlight on our site in, in a very simple way, I'll demonstrate in just a few minutes, some of the simple things they can and should do. And I'm not going to run through every one of these, but I think a lot of these are, are familiar with you to, to most of you that, that make a big difference for that, that visiting cyclist to give them a better experience. And, and for restaurants as well, you know, I mean, the, 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 the free bathrooms, you know, one that I, I know as a customer, whenever I can use a bathroom, I'm also looking at like, well, how can I, you know, how can I patronize this, this business? And, and unfortunately, you know, often businesses sort of think of, 
think of the the open bathrooms as something that's that's more of a burden and and, and pain for them. But it, uh, we try to help educate how this is really important. You know, and offering free water are ways to get cyclists in the door, um, and often will benefit them. Um, I am going to take you to the website here in a few seconds, but I just wanted to highlight a few of the the key things. So we do have an open source architecture opportunity for any of you, and I'm going to show a, a website that has gone up on our platform uh, since our webinar last week. Uh, it went up that afternoon, so this is a pretty easy to use format. Um, we, we obviously not only have the digital mapping, but we connect it with those local businesses, making those key links. Um, that there's a market com place component within this, and, and uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate that where it's just really easy for a cyclist to, to click through and go ahead and, and purchase either a bike hire, a bike reservation, a bike rental, or um, to book a hotel. And the chance to sort of really filter through searches and, and, and find key information, you know, maybe, maybe you're only interested in mountain biking, you're only interested in road riding, you're only interested in kid-friendly rides, chance to do all that. Um, being on the web and being web-based, you know, all the tools that we're able to integrate with translating different languages and currencies makes it super easy. The chat boxes to, to give support, and of course, things that are just standard today, um, not only photos, but video integration and making that super easy um, for people to sort of get a sense of what they might be able to, to see and explore. Uh, and of course, rating and comment options for folks. And the social media connection. Um, to be clear, all business listings are entirely free, um, and we do make it very easy. It, it's a matter of you know five minutes typing in a few key pieces for a business to get listed, and then you know making certain that those those businesses are connecting with the local rides. Um, so we do really try to also use the platform as a way to nudge in a very significant way businesses to cater to uh, to cyclists. So. I'm just going to escape out of uh, uh, PowerPoint here for just a second and, and switch over to the uh, the Cycle Life HQ platform. So, um, so here we have you. You can also just check this out on your own time as well, CycleLifeHQ.com. And I've gone ahead and clicked into our U.S. listings. We have a lot in, in Australia with where Charles, of course, and the company was founded. But the U.S. really is our focus. And I'm going to go ahead and, and click on uh, one example site here. And I want to highlight that this is a site that was done by a local ambassador um, who had tried to convince his city that Vernal could be the next Moab in Utah. Um, that there was a significant economic development opportunity, and not surprisingly, he was dealing with a lot of, you know, old school thinking with uh, the town council, and they're like, yeah, hmm, no, not so much. And then when he found us as a platform, um, I think he was more than delighted to find out how simple and easy it was to get stuff loaded. So I just want to highlight that, and, and I'm going to dig into this site a little more because I think that, that Kyle did a great job sort of pulling a lot of these pieces together, and, and it demonstrates on how well the platform works. So we always start with a really nice epic photo to sort of inspire folks like, I want to bike there, and you know that's a beautiful looking arch. We have the rides right up the top. And in this case, they're all clumped together. We got seven different rides. There's a lot of opportunities to customize things. So some communities we have beginner rides or um, intermediate rides listed. Uh, we always have itineraries. So even in this one little town, here's an example of how you can spend four days. You can see uh, the hotels, the bike rental and bike shop. Um, not a lot of local food options, but there's, there's a craft brewery, so that's pretty important. An overview of the region and uh, a local guide. So Kyle is the guy who actually helped load all this information and who is uh, starting his own guiding business. But let me just sort of dive into one of these rides and show you so the, the level of content we have just clicking on to, to any single one of these rides. So this ride, Retail Sale in the McCoy Flats, uh, you, you can very quickly get a sense of the terrain. Like, okay, this is wide open. I definitely got to put my sunscreen on and bring a lot of water with me. There's a little text description so you can sort of read into it a bit more. And here we have the video integration. So you can even click on, get a chance to really sort of see how extreme or easy some of the riding is around there. The trail map, 
which has the locate me features, which I'm obviously not going to do, given it's a long way from Washington, D.C., um, getting directions to the trailhead, uh, profile information, that's real key. And then you can hear, see some of the, the filtering pieces. So this is highlighting that this is a mountain bike ride. You know, things that are really key for me as a visitor that I'm able to see, like, okay, it's an intermediate ride. I might be able to do that. Um, but, you know, what's the trail signage like? Oh, it's excellent, and there's good cell phone coverage. So even as a visitor, I have some assurance that I'm going to be able to find my way around. And if I do get lost, I'm going to be able to get help easily if, if it really gets dire. I can also see that there's toilets at the trailhead. I place I can park my car if I'm road tripping out there. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, some of the nearby stuff, including that, that local shop. So quite a bit of content in there. And whether it's a mountain bike ride or a road ride or an urban ride, it's, it's all in this format. So very, very user friendly. <clears throat> I'm going to scroll down here just to highlight how this interacts with some of the businesses. So if I click on the Marriott Town Place Suites here, you can see at first it pops up with the actual rate and I can go ahead and make a booking right away. Like, oh, I'm going to be there next weekend and let me see if there's a room available and I can go ahead and, and, and pay for it. So super user friendly there, you know, some content. It's got the, the classic photos where, of course, you're going to get the whole place to yourself. But the thing that's really different from this from any other, you know, hotels.com or uh, Viator or whatever, is that we have the bicycle friendly features. And this is this is key in two different directions. Um, first, for the consumer, I can see like, okay, they've got laundry, information about a local shop and routes. It's pretty basic. I'm coming in with realistic expectations that they're not catering to me, they're not gonna have a bike stand and tools available for me, or they're not gonna have bikes available for me to to, to, to use while I'm there. Um, but, but I, I, you know, you know, maybe, maybe I'm able to compare that with other, uh, hotels, but I, I have a realistic expectation. Now, the other way that this works and I love, and, and I think for, you know, most of you who are advocates, you can see grayed out all the cycle friendly features. So having a place to lock your bike or wash your bike or having a stand and tools, these are all right there. It's, it's very easy for a manager to be loading up this information and think twice very quickly. Huh, wonder what I can do to get more check boxes here, to be able to say to my staff, hey guys, don't we have a storeroom downstairs that we're not using that we might turn into a bike locker room? Or we have a hose on the side of the building that we could allow our guests to use when they need to wash off a bike. I don't want people washing their cars, but someone washing off their bike, that's not a big deal. Let's make that available to them. So very simple things that they can at low or no cost whatsoever, be able to uh, think about ways that they can better cater to uh, visiting cyclists. So that's that's the example of, of, of how we work with the businesses to highlight that. Um, I'm gonna go back uh, out here for a second. And, and highlight uh, another example. Um, I'm actually gonna go to the September 11th National Memorial Trail. And this one's a little different because it's it's a much larger regional. So this, this is a good example of where we're working on a multi-state basis. And so the, the route being so big, we've broken it down into sort of like day size pieces that maybe the average longer distance cyclist is not gonna be intimidated by riding. And you can see there's just key stats here. You know, it's 51 pages, 51 miles and so forth. And there's a chance to just sort of quickly scroll through and see what that route looks like. But if I click onto that actual um, embedded link, it's going to open up the September 11th National Memorial Trail. And I'm actually going to skip ahead because I think I have that one loaded, preloaded here. Yeah. Um, so here we see this 50 mile route and we can see the restaurants right along the way. So I can even click onto that icon. It opens it up to tell me which restaurant this is. Um, a, a second click here is going to go ahead and open up that restaurant. So it's the Winber Hotel. I'm going to click onto it again. And boom, I'm already in here. Now, we're not expecting people to buy food through the website. So our website always gives people an option to either just directly link in with their website. This is something the business owner can set up while they're putting up their listing um, or direction to their menu. But uh, again, a chance to sort of see what they have. And, and most of these listings also list um, what they're uh, by 
break and hand it over to Lee to sort of highlight what Tucson's been doing specifically. Take it away, Lee. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and hi, everyone. My name is uh, Lee McLaughlin. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing at Visit Tucson, as you can see from the slide there. Uh, and I'm just going to take you through some of the ways that, uh, that we market cycling, but uh, specifically how we partnered with Cycle Life HQ to kind of improve on, uh, on everything we do in that space. Um, so, Jeff, if you go to the next slide there. Um, so, some of you might be familiar with Tucson as a cycling destination. Um, you know, uh, we kind of always looked at it as like we have a built-in bike culture here in Tucson. It's something that's been an important part of, of Tucson's culture for a really long time, uh, as long as I can remember, and I was born and raised here. So we've always uh, had had that kind of component and uh, that 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 culture. Uh, all all of the all over the city, people love to ride their bikes. We've gotten some of these great uh, accolades that you can see on the screen here: a gold award from the league, uh, recently rated as the number two large city uh, by Places for Bikes, uh, People for Bikes uh, rankings and number five overall city there. Um, and, and in addition to that, that culture, uh, you know, people locally loving to ride their bikes, we have some great bike infrastructure that's kind of popped up around that. You know, our local government entities have seen that uh, it's an important part of everyday life here in Tucson. So they've really invested in, in building that uh, along with local advocacy groups. Um, so we have some really great infrastructure uh, like the loop which was recently completed a 131 mile mixed use path that goes uh, pretty much around the perimeter of the city. Uh, Jeff showed a couple of photos of that, but really lovely paved paths uh, that, that take you all over town. Uh, we also have really great mountain bike trails, hundreds of miles of single track uh, all over town. We're surrounded on all four sides by mountain ranges. So tons of great mountain biking opportunities. Um, and then we have some really great cycling events uh, that happen on an annual basis, like El Tour de Tucson. It's a perimeter cycling event. It goes around the city uh, in different distances up to over 100 miles. Uh, and then the 24 hours in the Old Pueblo, which is one of the, the biggest and best 24-hour mountain bike races in the world. Uh, those events have been going on here for for years now. Um, and then we also recently uh, added a bike share program, uh, allowing people to, to use those bikes to get around some of the urban areas, uh, you know, whether they're locals or travelers, uh, being able to explore a little bit. So we have that great culture. We have this great bike infrastructure. So one thing that, that we probably hadn't done a very good job of uh, on, on the tourism marketing side was really pushing that. And trying to leverage that culture and that infrastructure for tourism promotion. Um, and so, you know, Jeff mentioned a lot of those stats. It's a, it's definitely a burgeoning market. It's a really popular thing to do. And we have these great assets and we're a top cycling destination. So we really wanted to push it. And that's something that we've, uh, you know, really uh, implemented as, as kind of a pillar of the Tucson brand, especially over the past several years here. Um, so, you know, what that means for us as marketers, uh, if you go to the next slide, Jeff, what that means for us is developing some cycling specific campaigns. Um, so, you know, we're looking at uh, outdoor specific publications, uh, like working with Outside Magazine, you know, great distribution there, great audience for us. Uh, and so we partnered with them last year to sponsor their annual bike test uh, where they get all of the, the upcoming model year bikes, uh, road and mountain, and test them, do write-ups, rankings. And so we worked with them to have Tucson be the location of that bike test, uh, but really infuse our branding and our messaging into everything that they did around the test with some great video creatives, some written articles, kind of featuring Tucson and you know showcasing us as a, a great place to ride uh, as part of being the, the pick for that bike test. Uh, we're also working with uh, large uh, travel publications like National Geographic Traveler, you know, not endemic to the outdoor or the cycling markets, but, you know, a really uh, large audience, great audience, people who are interested in active travel. So, you know, working with them uh, on some, some content and some advertising that specifically features cycling. And then working with uh, bike-specific publications and websites as well. 
A great example, we recently partnered with Pink Bike, which is a mountain bike uh, specific website and publication and uh, did uh, their local flavors series, which is a video piece kind of showcasing some of our great local trails and kind of talking about the, the bike culture, the advocacy groups that help do that trail work, things like that. And then also partnering with uh, other publications like Sunset Magazine. And then, of course, sponsorships of cycling events, both our local cycling events, which bring in a lot of visitors, but then also looking at cycling specific events that happen in some of our key feeder markets that we can go out, get in front of those people, show them that Tucson is a great cycling destination. We're committed to cycling as an activity and kind of talk to some of those people face to face. So all that's great. You know, we have these, these awesome distribution channels and we're doing this advertising and pushing it out there. But uh, for any of you who are involved in, in destination marketing or tourism marketing, you know that you need content to align with those campaigns. You can't just put a campaign out there and then when somebody arrives on your site or pushes through from one of those pieces, they're not met with the content and the information and the structure to kind of deliver on that promise. You know, we've told them that, hey, Tucson's a great cycling destination, so we need to have resources and content that align with that. So that's where Cycle Life HQ has come in for us. Um, so I'll show you just quickly some examples. Uh, you know, Jeff kind of already went over how the website itself works, but this is how we've leveraged it on our site. So we have a cycling specific landing page, all of those campaigns that I mentioned and those events drive to this landing page. It's visit tucson.org slash ride. Uh, and so you can see that page over here on the left. We've got some general intro content there at the top. But then we really just dive into the maps uh, and some of our favorite rides around town uh, that are hosted by Cycle Life HQ. Uh, people can see those maps embedded directly into the page and see, you know, wow, these different types of rides look great to me. And then they can dive further in, uh, more in depth on the Cycle Life HQ site by clicking through and seeing all of the information that you see on the right and kind of what Jeff walked you through earlier. So, you know, all of the, you know, that, that more in depth description, uh, you know, the distance, the elevation, all of those types of things. So, on that previous slide, we saw the loop, which I had talked about before, uh, you know, great long distance ride it goes all around the city, uh, something that's maintained by our county government. Uh, so we had, you know, some resources available there, but what we didn't have was the ability to provide some real uh, user-friendly context to that map. Uh, you know, it existed on a county government site, which is not the, always the best user experience, unfortunately. So putting it on our site, putting it in Cyclic HQ really allowed us to, uh, you know, integrate some of our partner businesses and, and show a little bit more about the ride. Um, and so in the next example that's up on the screen right now, this was something that was really intriguing to us was the ability to to create curated rides that didn't exist anywhere else. You know, kind of only limited by our imagination. And uh, again, as, as Jeff mentioned, really focusing on things that are unique to us as a destination. So we worked uh, with our county governments and our city government. We have a lot of great uh, street art murals in our downtown area. And we wanted to connect those uh, through kind of creating a, a self-guided tour that takes people around to all of those uh, different murals so they can see them. And so by working with Cycle Life HQ, we had a vehicle to actually create that map, uh, showcase each of the different pieces of art, and, and create a, a real actionable resource for those visitors that are coming in, you know, whether they're already riding or they're just looking for something to do downtown, uh, you know, Using the the bike share program that I mentioned, you know, would be great for this because it's all, you know, relatively uh, centralized around downtown. As you can see, it's really only about a six mile loop, so very easily done in in just uh, an hour or so. Um, so so that was something that was you know really exciting to us was not just the ability to showcase some of those more uh, the longer distance or fortified rides, but the ability to do curated rides that speak to us as a destination and showcase some of our unique assets. So as we move forward, what we're really looking to do is just kind of continue that partnership with Cycle Life and, uh, you know, continue to evolve those maps and that content, build a better user experience, do some more of those curated rides so we can showcase some of those different assets. Uh, and then we also worked with them to do a bike tourism assessment and, and a survey 
some of our local stakeholders in, in the cycling community and uh, on the government side. So reviewing some of those findings will really help us, you know, kind of develop a roadmap for how we carry it forward and help build on that experience once people are here and riding. And then we also recently help, held uh, bike tourism workshops where uh, we were able to kind of bring together some of our stakeholders in the cycling community, some of advocacy groups and uh, tour operators and things like that, and some of our hotel partners. Um, and so, you know, we as a as a DMO, a CVB, we've always had really great relationships with these hotel partners. They understand what we do. But for people on the cycling side, since it's not something that we as an organization have been particularly engaged with, you know, over the past decade or so, it's about developing that that new relationship uh, with, you know, both the, uh, those cycling businesses, but then also connecting them with our partners so that they can both see that we're committed to this and they can see how it benefits them. And so we're reviewing uh, feedback and info from those sessions and really hope to combine all of this to develop uh, an even better roadmap for how we promote cycling going forward. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Jeff, uh, but I'll be around for the rest of the session. If there are any questions, feel free. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lee. So just a couple of things sort of in, 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 uh, in summary and, and, and ways that we work with communities is, is, you know, sort of having that new lens of how to help highlight your community as a bicycle tourism destination. And, and as we mentioned earlier, those partnerships with local government agencies, many of whom many of you may already be working with now, is just a chance to really work at a different level and, and, and partnering with the conventions and visitor bureaus, CVBs, or the destination marketing organizations uh, and other stakeholders in the business community. Um, it's one of the big benefits. Um, so we, we obviously, as we mentioned, do a lot of assessment work and, and plan uh, for communities how to best activate their bicycle tourism um, offering. You know, the, the League's Bike Friendly America program, of course, is a fantastic thing to, to leverage and highlight on this. And so we encourage a lot of that work. Um, uh, but as you saw, we also have a very simple intermediate step where businesses can do the very basic things and, and be schooled very quickly on simple things they can do to better serve bicycle travelers and tourists. Um, of course, the the um, the showcasing uh, stuff online and connecting it with the social media and so forth. Um, that that's one of the most visible things that we do with communities, um, and we know that the the needs for folks like Lee is um, because often their budgets are linked directly with uh, hotel room taxes and so forth. They're always trying to figure out how to get more heads and beds, how to uh, add on to their um, their typical shoulder or off season times, um, how to how to make certain that the community is is uh, benefiting from tourism as, as much as it can. And as Lee as Lee highlighted, you know, having the Cycle Life HQ platform not only do we have a lot of this figured out how to make it super friendly to the cyclist, but it also makes it a lot easier for folks like Lee, where they don't have to worry about maintaining all this information and keeping it current. Um, that's part of why we exist, and, and, and it's super easy for us to be able to make an update and it should be live instantly, uh, not something where you have to worry about links breaking and or PDFs getting outdated and so forth. We actually want to invite all of you to, to be ambassadors uh, with Cycle Life HQ, but, but certainly encourage you to be an ambassador for bicycle tourism in your community uh, to make those connections with, with business and hospitality uh, communities and, and, uh, and to make it easier for uh, would-be travelers to come and enjoy everything that your community has. And then I want to highlight the revenue stream. So, you know, the primary piece, of course, is that when we help communities um, highlight their, their bicyclists, uh, bicycling assets to would-be visitors, um, that's where the biggest bucks are. You know, people coming in, staying in hotels, uh, staying uh, or eating at local restaurants and, and so forth. That's the primary piece. But as you saw on our website, we also have that booking option. And so as where a lot of intermediary websites will charge 20 to 40 percent commissions, um, Cycle Life HQ only charges a 10 percent commission. And we kick back a significant portion of that back to the local community. 
Um, so that's that's a way that we um, not only benefit those local businesses and that there's less being charged, but that we're actually uh, sharing in that profit back to the community. So it is community specific. So uh, as Tucson starts generating more revenue, um, uh, potentially some through our website, then we're going to be sharing that back, um, which hopefully will also benefit wayfinding signage or, you know, eventually uh, to help increasing infrastructure and so forth. So just sort of give a quick overview of the assets that we can bring is, you know, really helping the communities um, assess uh, where situations are. And, and a lot of these you may already know within your community, um, but we have that benefit of being the outside experts. We can come in and we can lend further leverage to some of the things that you're really hoping to do. And, and I, I will highlight, we always uh, are very conscious about working with our local partners and, and supporting uh, their effort, but also bringing that sort of fresh focus as outsiders to really sort of highlight um, what the community has and, and looking at things in new. Um, again, the platform being a key piece, but connecting it with the, the, the businesses and, and really helping um, uh, you know, get things out there further, getting more eyeballs on sites, getting more heads in beds, and then driving that growth, particularly through social media channels. Um, I do want to highlight some resources we have uh, on our site. In addition to the Cycle Life HQ, we have a second site which we'll send a link to as a follow-up email that um, I think is www.tourism slash Cycle Life HQ. So we have a lot of information up about that um, and, and how-to guides really you know, for, for communities. Um, our ambassador program, um, you know, basically any of you who are interested in helping get your community promoted, uh, getting up uh, information about your favorite rides, your favorite places to eat, um, you know, whatever content and so forth, uh, really is an opportunity for you to help grow the brand of your community and, and lots of love that we're going to give back um, in, in highlighting that and, and also swag and so forth. So happy to happy to talk about some of that. and. Um, before I totally open up to questions, I do want to go back um, to the uh, the Cycle Life HQ website and give the example from from last month where um, where uh, Rick in Provincetown was on this webinar, and uh, and so I think he just started poking around like, oh, well, let's see how easy it is to go ahead and and do this listing. I mean, you'll see in the in the upper corner here where you can just go ahead and click create a listing whether it's for a ride or a business. I mean, it's all very simple and straightforward, but I'm gonna scroll on down here so we can see Massachusetts has a new listing and there's Provincetown. And so with a few hours of work, Rick was able to um, upload some photos, get some content together, obviously highlight that they're a bike friendly community, um, have the connections with Bike Provincetown, uh, list a few of his favorite rides, some of the local places you can rent bikes, um, get bikes worked on, other points of interest, and you know he's already got one one uh, place to eat and drink up here. Um, so, and you can already see here like they've got free Wi-Fi, good bike parking, and a toilet that's available to to cyclists. So you can see quite a bit of user-friendly content uh, that resulted in just a few hours work uh, from Rick, and uh, you know he notified us. We stitched it together and had it up that evening. I think uh, this went live about two or three hours after our last webinar. So just a nice demonstration of where this is um, much easier uh, as a platform to really get, get your community up there and out there. So um, with that, I'm going to pause for a second, Amelia, and see if there's some questions we might be able to answer. Great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, yeah, we've got a couple questions and folks, um, you, you do have a few more minutes if um, you'd like to type in your questions. Now's, now's your chance. Um, so uh, first question, what does it cost to have a listing? And I think that's both for um, businesses and communities, um, destinations generally. Um, what's the so, yeah, so as I mentioned, for, um, for any businesses, it's entirely free and, and communities can also um, uh, use the platform and put stuff up. In, in situations like uh, Tucson and some other communities that we are contracting with, we're doing much more work. We're doing, you know, we're doing a lot of this sort of assessment work. 
we're helping pull things together, highlighting what are the best features of the community, all with the you know sort of direction and producer rights that that Lee and and, and other destination marketing organizations, um, you know, as our customers, they they have that sort of oversight control, but we do a bulk of the work getting everything up connected online and so forth. Um, and then even helping out with some of the, the marketing afterwards. So, you know, in those cases, we're doing contracts in the five to $25,000 range, depends on the size of the community and the, the scale of what they're hoping to do. So, um, so we've got it on one end where it's entirely free, enjoy the platform, go for it. Uh, in the partnership places uh, like Tucson and some of the other communities we're working with, um, then, then once we're getting that set up with them through the contract work, that's also then when we start doing the profit sharing piece. So that's something that um, we look forward to it, not only paying for itself, but really being an investment engine back into the community. Great, thanks. So just to clarify what Rick created last week after the webinar, um, what we're seeing now for Provincetown, that he, he did that without having to pay anything at all, correct? Entirely free. Cool. All right, next question. If anyone can create listings, how does it work if there are duplicate entries or checking for accurate information? So um, we help make certain that there aren't duplicate listings. Um, and uh, if for some reason we don't catch that ourselves and we have a whole tech team that that's working behind the scenes on stuff like this that, that um, amaze me. Um, it's not me doing a lot of that. Um, that that's uh, that's something that, you know, just a, a, a quick email or chat with us and we will happily rectify. Um, one of the things, particularly in the, the communities where we partner with um, folks, we're, we're trying to work and engage uh, particularly local advocates, but also the destination marketing organizations to really help verify and be, you know, the, the fact checkers on the ground um, is indeed this business a, a bicycle friendly business. You know, when they say that they, they cater to cyclists and then, you know, someone, the local advocates say, uh, actually, we've had a problem with this business because they don't allow bikes through their drive through window. Then, then we can uh, go back and have a conversation with the businesses um, and, uh, and and are correcting. So, um, so we do look at you know we we see ourselves as a conduit to make this information super easy and accessible, both for for all of you helping promote your community, but also as consumers looking to to visit other communities by bicycle. Um, but but we know that we'll never replace that wisdom and local knowledge. Um, that, that really only locals have. So we we are always very focused on partnering with with uh, locals and particularly bike advocates. Great, thanks. I think we have time for just one more question. Um, is there a GIS component, for example, can you type in a destination and ask for it to generate a bike route? Um, I can't answer fully the GIS piece. I mean, certainly on the website you can you can search for communities and there's the filter pieces we have. So, um, you know, we are looking forward to working with many more communities so that literally as people say, oh, hey, I'm going to be going into uh, Raleigh Durham. What are the biking options there? Or I'm going to cruise on over to Chattanooga. That they can they can simply use the the website and one of the things I forgot to mention is not only does the website work across all devices it is mobile friendly but we do have a new Cycle Life HQ app um, which is um, automatically populates based on where you are what the nearest rides to you are um, there's there's some things we're looking to enhance that uh, app even more but um, I encourage everyone to check out Cycle Life HQ on on the app store of your your device type and um, and, and give that a try and, and uh, certainly on on the pl web platform or the app any insights questions feedback here's both Charles and my email this is my cell number, so you're welcome to text or call me as well if you if you have any questions or want to discuss further. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jeff. So we're at the hour mark, so I'm going to wrap up the webinar now. Thank you so much to everyone again for attending, spending this hour with us, learning about bicycle tourism and how it can be a benefit to your community. Um, please do feel free to reach out to Jeff and Charles, as you can see their contact info, and look for an email from me uh, in the next couple days with the recording and links um, to all the great resources that uh, have, have been mentioned today, including the slides. Um, so thanks again to our speakers. Um, Jeff, Charles, and Lee, we really appreciate your time as well, and I uh, hope everyone has a great day.
Thank you, Amelia, and thank you, Lee, for joining us as well. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye, everyone.